my request uh, mr murari raghavan still okay. advocate to formally comments uh, by his uh, comments thank you srinivas raghavan welcome all i have great pleasure on behalf of amicus to invite you all to this lecture by mr nl raja now of course nl raja needs no introduction to any of us and whatever i say will be a super fluid uh, thing because all of us know him so well but uh, for the benefit of a few of us who may not have interacted him quite so closely let me just point out a few facets of his multi talented personality apart from being a very successful and popular senior advocate he has great interest in heritage structures and heritage building and the culture and heritage of india tamil nadu in particular as a member of the heritage committee of the madras high court he has done stellar work along with some judges in uh, revamping and uh, refurbishing uh, the madras high court to its original glory if all of you walk to the corridors of the madras high court you will now see new gleaming structures where old cobwebs used to hang raja had no small measure uh, in fact a very large role to play in bringing this to its glory uh, one thing he used to do unfortunately is it's not possible for him to do it right now is to do heritage walks in the madras high court these used to be very popular and very well received not only uh, from lawyers and law students but architecture students general public and anybody who really was interested in heritage this is because of two things one is of course the glorious heritage of the madras court and the glorious building that we all visit every day or used to visit every day uh the other aspect which makes it so interesting is the wonderful way in which he presents all of it to us you know he, he breaks on every single thing he takes us through these uh, and points out the history of every single place uh it's very interesting i've been on one of these heritage walks and for those of you who haven't i would strongly recommend your taking part of it once the covid-19 pandemic ceases and he is able to resume his heritage walks now one other facet of his personality which i must point out is the fact that he is a very he is a consummate actor he is acted in the madras players adaptation of witness for the prosecution as a prosecutor uh, and he's done it wonderfully well i mean it's on youtube i would i would again strongly recommend that people who haven't seen this adaptation please go and see it of course his acting and if any judges are really in the group right now and watching this i must tell them that raja's acting is confined to the theater he doesn't carry it forward to the courts so whatever he does in the courts is is what he means is no acting part uh, maybe a little bit but not much now as far as today's subject is concerned Uh, interesting cases and uh, interesting incidents and cases relating to the madras high court there can be no better person than raja to present this to you because he is a huge repository of very interesting anecdotes and cases in the madras high court i have had the benefit of uh, of uh, of getting a few of these anecdotes from him during our several interactions but i'm sure that he has a lot more to share and Uh, one thing i can promise you is going to be a very interesting very witty and an educative uh, session all along i look forward to this and i would now request raja to please start thank you thank you uh, murari for those uh, very kind words uh, possibly excessively kind um, so i chose this topic when um, people from amicus shrinivas raghavan murari vishnu and uh, many of our friends in the group thought it is a good idea for me to talk about this um, it really was a challenge as to where i should start and where i should end because this madras high court is such a rich uh, repository of information interesting incidents interesting people with huge contributions to the welfare of the nation huge contribution to the development of literature to the development of uh, uh, arts um fine arts uh, name it and so uh, and the country and the city owes so much to this uh, to this great institution so how do i go about this and in the matter of possibly one hour and one hour 15 minutes if i am to condense everything that i want to say that would be a huge challenge so what i did is i took a paper and pencil 
and said now let me think about whatever is on the top of my mind when somebody tells me make a list of interesting cases and incidents of the madras high court this is simply what i have done this is by no means exhaustive because as i said um, if i am to say that this talk is going to be exhaustive it is like taking water from the ocean in the palm and saying this is the ocean it is really not there is so much more that all of you should read um, and the purpose i hope is to kindle that element of curiosity which will impel you to read more about the madras high court and if i succeed in doing that then um, i think um, i have done what i have intended to do in these the next following minutes so where shall we start as we all know <clears throat> the british rule of in uh, of this part of the country started in 1639 when two gentlemen francis day and andrew cohen stepped off the uh, sandy coast of coromandel and uh, also tried to negotiate for the uh, taking on rent a small sandy strip of land about 3 miles long and 2 miles uh, broad from the raja of chandragiri interestingly the firman the firman is equivalent to the government gvos that are passed today that firman says that the raja of chandragiri is granting permission to the british to set up fort st george in madras patna which means that madras is really the name of this place and uh, it is on uh, at, at least according to me on account of some misplaced uh, uh, you know notions uh, of uh, parochialism that we went about and changed the name to chennai it really is not a copy of that firman is still available um, and that very clearly says that fort st george should be permitted to start uh, set up operations uh, at madras patna so from then on the british rule of madras started and if you want to look at um, contemporaneously uh, what was happening in the other uh, major cities of the country calcutta was still an idea which is 50 years down the line um, job uh, charnock who was who is considered the uh, founder of calcutta i must also tell you that uh, don't go and say that in calcutta because there is an interesting writ petition filed in 2004 to declare that job charnock is not the founder of calcutta the calcutta high court set up a committee of historians to go into that question and ultimately found that there was a very very vibrant um, culture and civilization and settlement which was ex in existing in calcutta in the place where we call kolkata today even before job charnock came there so uh, but he is reputed as being the founder of uh, calcutta job charnock first came to chennai madras Uh, he was in fort st george and then resettled at uh, the place which we call calcutta today and went on to founding the city uh, bombay was just a cluster of islets which were then given away uh, as dowry by the spanish king during the marriage um, of uh, princess berganza to uh, prince charles ii so it was just a cluster of island there was no activity there and it would take a long time for the british to set down roots there Shah Jahan was still building Red Fort. Red Fort was not completed. The Mughal uh, 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 glory was at its full fury, and Shah Jahan had not completed Red Fort. This is what was happening in the other towns. So one of the themes that we have uh, in the old lighthouse, if you get a chance to go there, uh, there are two themes. We have a photographic exhibition. There are four rooms at the base of that wonderful lighthouse. and we have converted that into a photographic exhibition the madras high court heritage committee on two themes one of the themes is madras the first modern city of india everything modern about india started at fort say or at in and around the place that we inhabit every day when we go to the madras high court the entire list is all there since that is not the topic of today's uh, presentation i will not elaborate on that but i would invite you to kindly visit that and to take a look at that the second uh, topic on which we have created that uh, photographic exhibition is the contribution of members of the bar to uh, the welfare of the country and the development of the nation if i were to create a photographic exhibition of all stalwarts in law i would need space for at least 200 to 300 photographs that was not the intention of what we put up there 
there are uh, photographs of 20 stalwarts who have uh, contributed to the development of the nation and to the development of the life in Madras, and were also founders of various institutions in Madras. I would invite all of you to go and visit there uh, when you go there. So this small strip of land is where all of modern India started. Let me then quickly fast forward to 16, uh, 1798. Now, why am I doing this? I'm doing this because, uh, well, uh, as the administration of justice, as the British rule in India proceeded, they also felt the need to have a system of dispensation of justice, administration of justice. So that started uh, parallelly. Initially, the British had no idea of dispensing justice to the natives. They only wanted a facility which will dispense justice to the British and the Europeans uh, who uh, inhabited Fort St. George. That was their only intention. But as they acquired more and more territory, it became inevitable that there must be courts which must be established to um, render justice to the people that come before them. These courts initially were only the company courts as they were called. If any of you want to appreciate the history, a uh, legal history of the period before the high court started, you must understand that there were two classes of courts. One was the company courts. The company courts were completely controlled by the East India Company. And from about the middle of the 19th century, we had, or the 17th century, we had the uh, courts which were the crown courts. The crown courts were primarily existing in the three presidency towns of Madras, Calcutta, and in Bombay. Because Delhi was still far down the line. So it is in these three uh, cities that you had the crown courts. Uh, as, uh, uh, you know, the as the settlements, the British settlements in India grew, there became necessity to confer these courts with more and more power. Now, uh, by 1798, the British were sadly disappointed in the manner in which the East India Company was administering justice in the country. Take Madras, for example. In Madras, there were two uh, primary uh, judicial bodies. One was the mayor and the alderman, and the other was the governor and courts. The mayor and the alderman were extremely corrupt. I don't have to say uh, lay emphasis uh, on this because generally, before the British uh, uh, the Parliament or the British government took control of um, territories in India after the Sepoy Mutiny in 1857, before that, the rule of India was largely by the East India Company, of course, subject to whatever regulations that the British Crown could bring in now and then. But the East India Company was one of the most corrupt companies ever known to mankind. Its offices were so corrupt that East India Company became bankrupt. You would wonder how such a uh, you know, fabulous uh, company with such fabulous prospects could ever become bankrupt. But that is what happened. But that did not prevent many of his officers from giving themselves multi-generational prosperity. If you were to go to England even today, please visit a place called the Powis Castle, P-O-W-I-S. It is the home place of uh, Robert Clive and his son, Edward Clive. And just that one castle in England has more artifacts and antiques and treasures from India than what our National Museum at Delhi has. I am not exaggerating. If any of you were to go to England, please visit that castle. One of the first words to be introduced into the English dictionary from India was the word loot. Right. So uh, these officers looted their company and looted the country so fabulously that they gave themselves multi-generational prosperity. But the British crown was not happy with this turn of events. So in 1798, they identified one of the tallest stalwarts in the legal field, Sir Thomas Strange, and relocated him from a place in Nova Scotia to come to the Madras, to come to Madras and to set up a recorder's court in Madras. So uh, Sir Thomas Strange landed up in uh, Madras um, and he then wrote to the British Crown 
and said that it's all right. You wanted me to set up a recorder score. I've done that. But I'm not very happy with the state of things here. We need a Supreme Court of Printers. It is therefore at his biggest in 1799, end 1799 and early 18. Uh, zero, zero, that the Supreme Court of Madras came to be established. Uh, originally, when it was established, it functioned in the same building in which uh, Tipu Sultan's sons had been imprisoned. But in 1817, it moved over to a building called the Bentix Building on First Line, what is today First Line Beach. But unfortunately, that beautiful building, which was in existence till mid-1980, came to be demolished. That's the type of, uh, you know, um, the commitment we have to uh, preserving heritage uh, structures. Uh, with this very, very uh, frail commitment to heritage structures, we demolished that beautiful building, which is Bentings building. Outside that building, that building, that place is today occupied by the Singara Valer Malige. Many of you would have gone to fast track courts there or other courts that function from that what I would call a very ugly building. Um, and you would see there is a small cupola outside that uh, building. That's all remains of the brilliant structure that existed there. And from 1870 to 1892, it housed both the Supreme Court of Madras and from 1862, the High Court of Judicature at Madras. So it was Sir Thomas Strange who gave us this British system which we are today administering. Um, and it is uh, in, in, in the homage to that, that the portrait of Sir Thomas Strange hangs in the Chief Justice's court, uh, the first court of the Madras High Court. Sir Thomas Strange, you know, many scholars, when you ask them about Madras, the development, the contribution of British scholars to the study of Indian laws, they would tell you that John D. May was the first person to write a book on Hindu law. That's not right. The first person to write a book on Hindu law was Sir Thomas Strange. He wrote a book called Elements, Elements in Bold, uh, of Hindu law. He did phenomenal research into concepts of Hindu law, reduced them to writing, and brought out this book. And by 1817, he had left Madras and had gone back to England. But his interest in Indra, India, the interest in the traditions of these people, the interest in the customs of these people continued, and therefore he wrote a second, uh, he wanted to write the second edition of that book. Unfortunately for him, even though he wrote to several the barristers here and several scholars here, asking them to update them about what has happened in terms of development of case laws on these issues, nobody responded. So the beginning of his second edition says that even the sun, after it sets, does not command respect. Therefore, I do not owe any thanks to anybody for bringing out this second edition. Notwithstanding the, you know, the uh, daunting obstacles that he faced, he did great research and was able to bring out the second. Now, this is uh, the way, way in which the British system, as we know it, and as we are uh, um, you know, operating even today, came to be established. That leads to the question, was there not a developed system of administration of justice in ancient India, medieval India, and uh, during the period of the Mughals? The answer to that is no. We had an excellent system of administration of justice. What is the uh, principal point on which the British system differed from the Indian system? The uh, principal point on which it differed was that the British wanted to centralize everything, right? But the native Indian system of justicing was a highly decentralized system, with the panchayat being the fulcrum of dispensation of justice. There is a very interesting 1934 Privy Council judgment, uh, Sitanna versus Veeranna, which was referred to by uh, Mr. Rohinton Nariman also recently. It is a case that came from the Madras High Court. The Madras High Court set aside a judgment of a Panchayat uh, Council, and that matter went up till the Privy Council. The Privy Council set aside the judgment of the Madras High Court and restored that of the Panchayat, playing glowing tribute to the functioning of these Panchayats as systems of dispensation of justice. 
so one of the primary differences is that india ancient india and even uh, medieval india and during the mughal period had a largely decentralized system of dispensation of justice but the system that the british left us which was heavily centralized today is the hallmark of the system which is why today you open the newspaper you read material about vacancies in the supreme court vacancies in the high court lack of infrastructure in the high court lack of infrastructure in the supreme court with very frail mention of the way of the vacancies in the magistrates court vacancies in the munsifs court lack of uh, infrastructural facilities in the munsifs court lack of infrastructural facilities in the magistrates court while in fact the magistrates court the munsifs court the district court are all the first points of contact of an ordinary litigant with the legal system so this uh, uh, you know this this uh, top heavy system of dispensation of justice was the uh, contribution of the british it has obviously not worked very well and possibly we should have stuck on to the decentralized system of dispensing justice which we had in ancient india uh, i have also given a talk about this for a in a forum called the tamil heritage forum you can google you can go into youtube and you uh, those of you who are interested can listen to this where i have sort of expanded on this one of my favorite themes that uh, ours the, the why our system is uh, not working very satisfactorily is because it is a highly centralized system of uh, dispensation of justice now uh, therefore and another major uh, difference between the european and the indian systems of justicing was basically in europe the law was a command of the sovereign but indian judicial system uh, did not accept any such proposition in india the even the king was under the law you know when there is this saying that high however high you be the law is above you it is uh, attributed to the uh, statement by uh, a jurist called thomas fuller said it about some two but when you drive into the madras high court uh, campus you see this statue of samani the chola where he actually implemented this principle that however high you be the law is above you because even a prince who was found to have violated the law faced punishment so i always say that we understood and implemented these principles much before the british even thought of them or any european mind thought of them so th these two i would say were the principal differences between the, in the manner in which we dispensed justice and the europeans uh, dispensed justice with of course a great emphasis on custom and usage customs and usage which once again were decentralized were allowed to hold sway over even vedas brutis shrutis and all these concepts because the endeavor of the persons charged with dispensing justice was to deliver justice and nothing stood in the way of delivering that justice so this is in passing uh, therefore in 1862 once again i fought fast forward from 1800 to 1862 because after the sepoy mutiny of 1857 the indian high courts act came to be passed in 1861 and pursuant to that high courts were established in bombay uh, calcutta and in madras and um, on a day which would uh, later become one of the most significant dates in the history of our country namely 15th august uh, it was on 15th august 1862 that the high court of judicature at madras was also established so that is when all this began in as far in so far as the high court is concerned but you can't uh, delink the functioning of the high court the establishment of the high court from its pedigree from its parentage from its lineage which was the supreme court of madras and the courts that existed before that because every bit of that system that exists earlier 
even today breathes life into much of what we do even take simple things like vakalat nama what word is vakalat nama vakalat nama is a persian word which was in use in the mogal courts who what is a vakil which language is vakil vakil was once again persian which existed uh, even in the mogal courts take this very colloquial use of the word tawa sutu what is tawa tawa once again is uh, you know derived from urdu and these are words which are current and which we use uh, even without knowing that these are all part of the systems that existed earlier right so this is one long line uh, a common thread that runs through the system of dispensing justice which we must be uh, always uh, conscious of so when the uh, high court came to be established in 1862 the first judge chief justice of that court he was also the chief justice of the supreme court of madras and seamlessly took charge also as the supreme court uh, of the high court of judicature at madras was a gentleman called uh, colly horman scotland now it is said with uh, tongue in the cheek that the lord chancellor of england at that point of time who was in charge of appointing all these judges was a scotsman and he had completely exhausted appointing spot scotsmen to various important positions uh, in england at that point of time a bit of nepotism as you you may call it that and when it came to the madras high court he was very keen on appointing a scotsman but unfortunately for him he was not able to locate any scotsman so it is said he did the next best thing he appointed somebody called scotland right uh, not scotland uh, uh, the profession legal profession and the vakils were much to him for one simple act that he did what he did was he decided to permit vakils to practice in the appellate side and original side of the madras high court when he took this decision the barristers in madras were aghast they were horrified they decided that they will go and protest against the enrollment of the first vakil in the madras high court a gentleman called raja rama rao his name was t rama rao the british later conferred the title of raja on him because he was the first vakil to be uh, enrolled uh, in the high court and uh, his enrollment uh, was because he had completed 10 years as an interpreter in the madras high court now the barrister's objection was that the qualifications required was a qualification in law and the fact that this gentleman had been an interpreter they said did not clothe him with sufficient qualifications to be sworn to be enrolled as an advocate now the role of an interpreter in the madras high court was a very very important one in those days because you must understand madras high court had jurisdiction over the entire madras presidency which started from uh, south of orissa and extended all the way up till kanyakumari save for the princely states of travancore mysore pudukottai etc so its jurisdiction was extensive and therefore the role of an interpreter was important because look at all the languages that were spoken in court or witnesses would give evidence in or documents would be filed oriya andhra <coughs> kannada malayalam english tamil urdu uh, therefore an interpreter had to know all these languages and uh, <clears throat> raja ramasrao's predecessor who is again a forgotten hero and who i hold in very great esteem is a gentleman called rangana sastri rangana sastri was remarkable cv rangana sastri his great great grandson is uh, just a cv kartikeya you know the madras high court he was a remarkable person he knew 17 languages and uh, you know towards the end of his lifetime he was actually learning aramic aramic is the language spoken by jesus christ and out of curiosity uh, he was reading aramic and he was functioning in the high court when chief justice of the supreme court of madras was a gentleman called rawlinson once again rawlinson was the first vice chancellor of the madras university the link between madras university 
and the high court had been a long and wonderful one and it is only in recent times that we have lost that link and rawlinson was the first vice chancellor of the uh, madras university he was terribly impressed by cb rangaraj sastri but he also realized that by permitting indians to get into british judiciary he was doing a great service to the indians and therefore at the heavy heart he allowed him to uh, relinquish his uh, post as an interpreter and to join as a judge of the uh, small causes court at madras this is a good nearly 20 years or 20 to 20 nearly 30 years before uh, justice muthusamy here became the first judge uh, indian judge of the madras high court so uh, these are people uh, whom we have sadly forgotten and uh, he uh, 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 raja ramarao came in that line of interpreters so the barristers in those days and uh, till uh, we um, you know this became an indian court 1947 the vakils and advocates were always uh, enrolled by the chief justice of the high court so uh, uh, scotland had fixed the time for enrollment of raja rama rao the barristers decided that they will at that point when his enrollment is called out will all stand up and protest but uh, getting news of this scotland sat about 15 minutes earlier called raja ram rao enrolled him and when the barrister stormed in he told them i am very sorry this is what has happened i have already enrolled him you can write to the lord chancellor and protest or do whatever you are advised to do so it is that gesture and that very important step that uh, uh, scotland took which was responsible for the indian vakils stealing a march over their counterparts in bombay and calcutta and this was largely responsible for our preeminence in the field of law and the person who laid the foundation for that was this gentleman called scotland the next judge whom i should mention is justice karnan not justice karnan karnan k e r n a n justice karnan was once again a remarkable judge Of the Madras High Court. So, what was so remarkable about him? Like Scotland, he endeared himself to the Indian vakils and uh, made uh, very, very useful contributions for their advancement. Uh, primary and early Norton pays the highest tribute to Captain Mengi. Says, if I were given the choice of selecting a bench to hear my original and appellate side matters. it would be muthusamy ayer and kernan for the original side and muthusamy ayer and kernan for the appellate side so this is the tribute that was paid to kernan by no less a person than early norton two of his closest friends kernan's closest friends were were uh, vakils called sundar sastri and biligiri ayengar why must we uh, make uh, uh, why is biligiri ayengar noteworthy Bilikiri Ayengar purchased the place that many of us, when we drive down Kramarajar Chowlai, which is the beach road, we pass a building called Vivekananda Illam. That Vivekananda Illam was built was purchased by Bilikiri Ayengar originally from a company from America, which was selling ice to India. That's why even today some people refer to it as Ice House. But that company went bankrupt. and biligiri ayenga bought that uh, uh, place and called it kernan castle in memory of his friend justice kernan and after vivekananda came and stayed in that place in 1897 it came to be called the vivekananda hill the third person who uh, comes to my mind is justice william holloway justice william holloway is responsible for one stupendous uh, contribution to the growth of indian vakils and that is he was a person responsible for appointment of justice t muthusamy ayer to uh, uh, the judiciary he was charged with the task of drawing up three names to be selected and appointed as a judge of the madras high court he wrote three names muthusamy ayer muthusamy ayer muthusamy ayer he could not think of a second name and that is what left to led to the appointment of justice t muthusamy ayer as a judge of the madras high court 
he had a long running feud with another very very notable gentleman of the madras uh, judi bar bruce norton bruce norton the of the same family of early norton was then the advocate general and wrote a very very strong uh, article criticizing the manner in which a justice was administered in the presidency talk holloway wrote a rejoinder to that and for a long time madras was entertained by the very uh, strong exchange of words between these two gentlemen uh, now let me go a little into two interesting cases that happened around this point of time the first case is the tirupati bahant case now uh, what is the background for this case after 1810 when east india company found that they were owning large extents of land it also became necessary for them to set up a system of collection of revenue to do this they appointed people whom even today we call as collectors they were in charge of collection of land revenue now these collectors had a very very difficult task to perform to go around and trying to collect uh, uh, you know uh, kist and other taxes from the rights was a huge daunting herculean task so the collectors came up with all their own ways of <clears throat> you know uh, a lot of whole lot of gimmicks to raise these funds one of which was to constantly keep donating money to temples because much of the valuable and fertile land in this part of the country was held by trust endowments and by temples and therefore they kept uh, making donations to temples they also uh, interestingly engineered some miracles and allowed these tales of these miracles to uh, circulate one of the very interesting ones is that of a collector called rose peter rose peter if you go to meenakshi amman temple today on meenakshi amman as you know is a warrior goddess and when she goes about in a procession she wears a stirrup made of gold with rubies inlaid in that that is a donation by rose peter to meenakshi amman temple which also came with the story that he was sleeping in his cottage when a small girl uh and he was woken up by the sound of her anklets woken up and she held his hand and took him out of the house and a few minutes later the house went up in flames and this was the miracle associated with rose peter and uh, his donation to the temple which is still a legend which is uh, circulating in madurai much of this was to endear the collectors to endear themselves to the local riots so that they would be thought of as being part of the indian community and it becomes so much easier for them to uh, you know levy and collect this kiss by 1840s by the mid of 1840s the church in england objected to this and said east india company is a christian company Now why are you going and uh, donating money to uh, temples in india therefore uh, the british Uh, east india company decided that they will recognize mahans mats uh, religious bodies endowments to take care of various temple properties and that they will distance themselves from the operation of these uh, endowments and only be in charge of collecting the kist and other taxes from them thus tirupati was handed over to a mahant successively that family unfortunately did not uh, discharge their duties uh to to in favor of the temple because even in those days tirupati attracted a lot of money a lot of offerings from uh devotees huge uh, amounts of donations so uh, the devotees filed a case against the mahan the case was this that during the consecration of the idol a flag staff was erected it is the usual tradition when flag staffs are erected to place a pot full of coins at the end of the flag staff and to bury it in stand and to erect the flag staff so what happened was the allegation was that this flag staff 
uh, the Mahan had misappropriated the gold coins that had been given by the devotees and had substituted those coins with base metals. And that was what is there at the bottom of the black star. So a criminal case was filed and the head priest of that temple, who was at loggerheads with the Mahan, filed an application to dig up that black star so that, that this point can be proved. The magistrate ordered that application and a revision was filed on behalf of the Mahan before the Madras High Court and came to be argued by that redoubtable barrister early Norton. Early Norton argued that you can't dig up the flag star. It will hurt the sentiments of the people. The religious sentiments of the people are involved. Faith is involved. So faith, uh, law must always give way to faith. As you would all know, for very many centuries in human existence, theological law was the law, starting from the Ten Commandments of Moses, the uh, <clears throat> I think the Talmuds of the Jews, the Vedas and the scriptures of the Hindus, the um, uh, biblical canonical law of the Christians, uh, the Quran of the Muslims. This was the law that governed people. It is only uh, in the last 200 to 300 years we have started giving ourselves secular laws. So this was an interesting clash between faith and the law. Subramaniya represented the head priest and objected to uh, the stand taken by uh, early Norton and said that no, what is more important than this religious dogma and faith is honesty. This Mahan has been dishonest. He has misappropriated the, uh, the property of the temple. Therefore, an opportunity must be given to the devotees to establish that this misappropriation had happened. And then he wound up his brilliant arguments by citing that famous Latin phrase, Fiat Justitia, Ruat Sinem. Let justice be done even if the heavens fall. Ultimately, that application filed by early Norton came to be dismissed, but it was a very interesting case of clash between faith and the law. And early Norton, citing scriptures, he argues for four hours, citing Hindu scriptures and uh, various uh, textbooks as authorities to say that it is the faith of the people should not be disturbed. And Subramaniya pleading that that must not be given precedence what must be given precedence is honesty and good faith. And if these are not found in the Mahant of such a holy place as Tirupadi, then these arguments must be fresh aside. Ultimately, the bench which consisted of Muthusavi here upheld the arguments of Subramani here and dismissed the application of early Norton. Sure enough, the flag stuff was dug up. Sure enough, the pot was unearthed and it was found to have basements. So that was a very interesting case, which once again uh, sent the Madras presidency into a bit of a uh, tizzy. Then the other important uh, and interesting case is Sullivan versus Norton. I have, I think in an article in the Hindu and uh, some of the recent articles, I have mentioned this. Sullivan, which uh, laid on a very important principle of law that um, the privilege of an advocate when he advances certain arguments into court and to say what he says, to ask certain questions. Norton uh, Sullivan was, a, uh, was, was again a very eminent person in Madras presidency. He was part of the Madras civil service and uh, he uh, was uh, drawn, was summoned as a witness in the case filed by the British Crown against the Zaminda of Modinayakuru. Uh, alleging that the Gamindar of Bodhinayakuru was involved in decoity. It is Sullivan's case that he was an absolutely unnecessary witness in the case and should not have been summoned at all. Early Norton put Sullivan in the box and asked him several embarrassing questions. After the case was over, under clause 10 of the letters patent of the Vidas High Court, uh, Sullivan filed a petition to say that stern action must be taken against Norton for all the things that he said in court against Sullivan and for unnecessarily summoning him as a witness in the case. That led to a wonderful uh, five-judge bench of the Madras High Court ruling firmly that 
early Stalin Norton was well within his rights to say what he had to say and that these are the privileges of an advocate. Now, uh, interestingly, the additional advocate general at that time supported uh, Sullivan and said that these privileges are recognized only in England and the Indian barristers and Indian vakils uh, do not have these privileges. The five judge bench of the Vidas High Court turned on that proposition and held that if there is any person who must receive all protection in the discharge of his arduous duty, that person is an advocate. A judgment which later came to be once again applied in the case of Vasant Pai versus Indri Vasant Pai, where Vasant Pai once again a redoubtable advocate of the Vidas High Court asked certain questions in the matrimonial proceedings against a lady, to a lady who was in the box and the judge reprimanded him and passed strictures against him for asking those questions. Uh, in those proceedings, uh, Basant Pai was represented by M.C. Settlebar and Govind Swaminathan and they uh, once again helped the court under the judgment delivered by uh, Raja Mandar. He said that these are the privileges of an advocate. These have been recognized in England and they shall be recognized in India also. So that again was a very sensational case during that time. I must also briefly now tell you about the events that led to the fall, to the opening of the Madras High Court, uh, the building of the Madras High Court. As I said, from 1862, the Madras High Court had been functioning at uh, uh, the, the Bentinck's building. And 1892, the government um, put up this wonderful structure in indo sarasari architecture. Interestingly, this indo sarasanic architecture was once again introduced for the first time in the world and later on it went to all British colonies, primarily what is Pakistan today, Bangladesh, uh, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, many of the South, 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 Southeast Asian countries uh, which were the colonies of the British. It was all designed by a mad uh, architect but a brilliant one called Paul Benfield. Paul Benfield for the first time designed the Chepak Palace by applying this architecture. indo sarasanic uh, as the name denotes, is a combination of Hindu and the British would refer to the Muslims as Saracens. So it was a combination of Hindu architecture and Islamic architecture. Uh, and he built this phenomenal palace, which is the Chepak Palace. Unfortunately, uh, there have been a lot of buildings which have come up all around the palace, which have made it difficult for us to appreciate the beauty of this building. Uh, but it is a wonderful building. And this was designed by Paul Benfi. And he was also a very clever and crafty man who went about, uh, um, you know, getting a whole lot of promissory notes signed by the Nawab. And this Nawab was left, right and center signing these promissory notes. And at, at, uh, by about 1820, this stood to a staggering amount of 22 million pounds. So the Nawab didn't know what to do. He went to the British for help and the British said, oh, don't worry, we will take care of all your problems. Just sign these few papers. And what were those papers? The papers were that the British would take over the uh, 22 million pounds and in exchange would give suzerainty over the entire Deccan region to the British. So, no war, not a single bullet fired, uh, no, not even a small skirmish, and the British came to rule the whole of Deccan on account of that one building which we pass every day when we come to court. Uh, those of us who take the Kamarajan road to come to the Madras High Court would know that, and we lost uh, only because of that uh, building. So, this is the same architecture that came to be applied to the Madras High Court uh, through the efforts of two brilliant minds, Henry Irwin and a person called Nambarumal Chetty. Nambarumal Chetty and Henry Irwin combination have created several brilliant landmarks in the Madras city which exist even today. And Nambarumal Chetty and Henry Irwin applied a type of architecture which was bottoms up. Why? Because the ordinary mason was asked to give his ideas about what should go into this building. And all that became part of this wonderful building, which is the Madras High Court. Interestingly, Nambarumar is 
the presiding deity or one of the uh, next to uh, Rangaradhar in Sri Rangam is one of the main deities in the Sri Rangam temple. Now, as you all know, Sri Rangam temple has 21 towers. Madras High Court has 21 domes. And it is said that these 21 domes were number marks contribution or uh, uh, tribute to the goddess of justice. And uh, these were, uh, were sort of erected and were put in place as to, uh, to give this entire building a sacred aura. Thus was the contribution of Henry Irwin and Number Marchetti in erecting this uh, wonderful building. I must travel back a little in time to talk about two associations, two events that led to the formation of two uh, associations. One on 9th, 14th March, 1865, when the Madras Bar Association came to be established. Now, even though Madras High Court is not the first among the three high courts that came to be established, the Madras Bar Association is the first professional association and it precedes both the Calcutta Bar Association and the Bombay Bar Association. This was primarily established as a professional body to maintain standards in the profession, to make representation on behalf of the barristers. Only barristers could be members. But subsequently, they permitted Indian barristers also to be members. Only they could be members. And thirdly, as an advisory role to the government in respect of any bills which they may place before the legislative assemblies. So this was the role. And they also maintained very strict professional standards among barristers. One of the very famous cases that came before the Madras Bar Association is the case of this gentleman called Valley. Valley was a barrister from England. He came to Madras and he found that the competition among the uh, barristers was quite intense. So he decided, he thought about this and decided, where do all these cases come from? These cases come from the fertile agricultural regions of the presidency. So he hit upon a brilliant idea. He said that he would go and park himself in one of the richest agricultural belts of the presidency and start practice there. You know, there is a bank robber who was asked the question, why do you rob banks? He said, that's where the money is. Likewise, Valley decided we'll go right away to the place where the briefs emanate. And he set up practice in Tanjore. And what did he do? He is a barrister. He has come from England. How do people know about him? So he hit upon brilliant idea number two. He printed pamphlets, gave it to the station master, and everybody who alighted from the train was given a pamphlet which said, go to Valley if you are in need of legal help. Stuff like that. So the Madras Bar Association came to know about it and was uh, infuriated with what uh, Valley was doing. So they commenced professional action, action against him for breach of professional ethics. Valley said, where do you get the authority to do all these things? The professional body that regulates my practice is the inner temple where I have been enrolled. You don't have uh, any uh, jurisdiction to take action against me. Then the Madras Bar Association wrote to the inner temple and it is on account of the efforts of the Madras Bar Association that the first professional action against a person practicing law in Madras presidency came to be taken and he was debarred from practice. Now, after some time, while this was developing, Muthusamy year in 1882 mentioned that Madras Bar Association is all very fine, but it represents only the interest of the Madras barristers. You need an association Indian Vakils need an association to represent their interests. Thus came into existence the Vakils Association, which was started and the first meeting was held on 1st March 1889. The first success of this uh, um, association was to uh, um, persuade Sir Arthur Collins, who was the Chief Justice of Madras High Court, to allot two rooms in Bentick's building for the use of the association. Lord uh, Arthur Collins gave him that license but he said you will have to vacate it whenever any sessions case is going on so it was a bit of a musical chair which was being played whenever a sessions case came these lawyers would be dis dislodged after the case was over 
they would come to occupy it, which all made uh, the uh, practice, um, the, the, the profession very uh, difficult. So the Vakils petitioned the government, and that is why when this wonderful building, which is the Madras High Court, came to be established, a separate wing for housing the advocates came to be also established. So the uh, MBA and the Madras High Court Advocates Association grew in parallel and uh, attained evidence. I must also tell you at this place about the um, entry of women professionals into the entry of women into the profession. There are two persons that I should talk about. First is a lady called Ananda. This poor woman studied law and she got a degree from the Madras University. But she didn't know what to do with that degree. So therefore, she approached the governor and requested the governor to give her a job. The governor said that, uh, 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 the governor said uh, he didn't know what to do with it. And therefore, he forwarded that to the chief justice. The chief justice didn't know what to do with that. He forwarded that petition to the uh, registrar of the high court. Ultimately, the registrar of the high court wrote a letter back to her and said that, listen, even men don't have work in this profession. Um, and we also don't know how to fit a woman uh, into any government job. So please, uh, don't, uh, we can't sort of help you. So by that time, S.S. Srinivas Iyengar, who was the Advocate General, took pity on this lady and took her in as an apprentice. So at, at that point of time, it was impossible for a lady to get enrolled at the bar or to even hold the job of a lawyer in any government department. The lady who was first enrolled in the bar was a lady called Sita Devadas. She probably had better luck in getting enrolled because she was the daughter of a judge of the high court. But even then, we don't know how she fared in the profession. But these two names are the first in the profession. One, who got a uh, qualification in law. And the second, for having actually practiced law. Let me talk about another interesting incident that happened outside the Madras High Court. When the Simon Commission came to Madras, as you all know, there were protests all over the country. And uh, there was a protest outside the Madras High Court. Primarily, it was because Simon Commission was appointed to explore the possibility of giving greater self-rule to the Indians. But that commission did not have a single Indian. So the Indians were quite uh, annoyed uh, and said that, uh, you have set up a commission which doesn't even have Indian representation, and there were protests outside all over the country. The Madras High Court also witnessed certain very, very um, disturbing incidents right outside the Madras High Court, and right outside where the Madras Bar Association presently is. There was a march of all these nationalists from one end, there's a bunch of policemen coming from the other end, and uh, these two were on the point of clashing. Now, the two Indian judges who were, the High Court judges who were watching the proceedings from the terrace got very disturbed, got down and uh, tried to go into the crowd thinking that if the crowd saw two judges of the High Court, they would immediately stop in the tracks and go back. Nothing like that happened. So the judges immediately uh, summoned the chief principal magistrate, chief presidency magistrate, who is a person called Krishnan, and asked him uh, to immediately order firing on the crowd. Now, the commissioner of police of Madras and that person was a trigger-happy person, much like General Dyer of the uh, infamous General Dyer of the Jallian Wallabag massacre, Trevor Phillips. Trevor Phillips was also raring to go. He wanted to fire at the mobs, uh, but Krishnan uh, refused to give permission for that to happen. Uh, but after a particular point of time, it became a little difficult to manage the situation. And therefore, he gave orders for firing with this strict caveat that the firing must be below the knees. However, very unfortunately, a youngster called Partha Sarathi from Triplican, who was part of the nationalist, got injured and lost his life in that firing. T. Prakasa, a formidable barrister, uh, was watching the proceedings from the terrace of the Madras High Court, he rushed out, took the body of Parthasarathy, flung it over his shoulder, stood between the police and the crowd and said, the next shot that you fire from your gown must kill me. It's only after that you can uh, kill 
you can uh, fire at this crowd. He was a formidable lawyer with a great reputation as a nationalist. The police did not want to stoke, uh, uh, you know, all this confusion that was going on, and they started retreating. And that is when it is in that incident that he got the name of Andhra Kesari. And thereafter, his uh, graph in this political career was meteoric, and he went on to become the chief minister of Andhra Pradesh. So, one of the first chief ministers of Andhra Pradesh was from the Madras High Court and a member of the Madras Bar Association. Uh, we are today talking about technology. We are talking about the implications of technology in the practice of law. But actually, one brilliant barrister of the Madras High Court applied it much before anybody could even think of it. And that brilliant barrister was Dr. Swaminathan. Dr. S. Swaminathan was the father of Govind Swaminathan, my senior. And he truly was a remarkable man. He came from a very, very impoverished Palagat Brahmin family, could not even afford to pay for his education. Uh, it is Ammu Swaminathan, whose family, Ammu Swaminathan, a person whom he would marry later, who would then go on, Ammu Swaminathan herself is a person of great eminence. She was one of the members of the Constituent Assembly. She was one of the signatories to the Constitution of India. And uh, it is her family which actually funded the education of Dr. Swaminathan to go to uh, England and acquire his qualification in law. And then from there, he went to Harvard and acquired one of his uh, acquired a doctorate in law, which is one of the first doctorates which the Harvard University, the law department of the Harvard University gave. And um, the, the scholarship that enabled him to do this uh, study was a scholarship called the Gilchrist Scholarship. And when he later succeeded in life to a remarkable uh, degree, um, and when there was actually a proposal to name a road after him, which is an offshoot of Harrington Road, he said, please don't name it after me, but name it after the scholarship that enabled me to be what I am today. And even today, there is a Gilchrist Avenue, which is off Harrington Road uh, in Madras. So Dr. Swaminathan, appeared for the Mirastar of Pundi. The Mirastar of Pundi was accused of murdering his daughter-in-law, Dhanam. His son, Ayasami, who was mentally deranged, was an eyewitness to the incident. And when the police uh, arrived at the scene, he merely pointed to his dad when they asked him who was responsible for this. On account of that, Vaidyanathan, who was the Mirastar of Pundi, came to be prosecuted and he was convicted by the Madras High Court. An appeal had to be preferred because the Madras High Court had granted an order that he shall be hanged. An appeal had to be preferred. And Dr. Swaminathan sent a telegram of the entire grounds of appeal to his council in Privy Council, to, to, to his council in London, who immediately filed it in Privy Council. And thereafter, this grounds, which had been telegraphed, was transmitted to the judge who, at that point of time, was vacationing in the south of France. The judge granted a stay of the sentence. The matter was heard. Uh, Dr. Swaminathan traveled all the way to England to attend the hearing. And Vaidyanathan, here, Vaidyanathan the Virasdar of Pundi, was acquitted. And after he came back to Madras, he was informed that the Mirastar of Pundi was waiting with a huge crowd and garlands to receive him. Uh, Dr. Swaminathan was a very private person who hated all this uh, show and pomp, And therefore, he got down in one station before and walked to his house. And that is the type of a reticent person he was. And a very grateful Mirastar of Pundi gave him a bag of gold coins in addition to the fees that he had already paid him. Dr. Swaminathan refused and said that you already paid me my fees. I will not take this. The Mirastar of Pundi persisted. Then with that bag of gold coins and the Mirastar of Pundi, uh, Dr. Swaminathan uh, bent and gave that money for the, for, the, for the missionaries who were then running the E.V. Kalyani Hospital. And that was a huge corpus on the basis of which 
that institution was run for a long time. So this was the use of technology in a court proceeding much before uh, technology as we know it. Today we are saying that we are doing e-filing, that we are doing uh, e-hearing um, and all sorts of technology related stuff. But it is actually Dr. Swaminathan who applied the use of technology in the court proceeding much before anybody could have even thought of it. Then, I must also tell you one interesting incident. When you come to incidents, I must also tell you about the visit of Lord Spence. Lord Spence was the chief justice of the federal court. When he visited the Madras High Court, there are two in in interesting incidents that happened. And one was, he wanted to visit the uh, court of one of the presiding judges when the court was in session. So the register was escorting him to the 11th court. 11th court is the court. Then it was the 11th court. I think when I joined the profession, it was the 16th court, uh, which is where the MHA library is. One of the most beautiful court halls. It is said that it was the chief justice's court hall uh, when the city civil court was first inaugurated. And that is why it owes its grandeur to that. The city civil court then got its own building and moved out of the high court. Uh, and uh, as he was walking towards the court, um, he was asking the registrar, who is the judge who is presiding over this court? And he was told that it was a judge who was from the service. Lord Spence stopped in his tracks and said, oh, you mean an unprofessional uh, judge? I don't want to visit his court. And he retraced this step. Now, this term unprofessional judge is something which you need to understand. The judgeship in the Madras High Court was drawn primarily from the barristers practicing in the Madras High Court. Some judges came from either England or from different British colonies. There were also judges who were appointed from the subordinate judiciary. The judges who were appointed from the subordinate judiciary were not from the profession. For example, Muthisami here had never practiced law. He had never been a practicing vakil, to, so to say. So these judges were called unprofessional judges, not because of the quality of the service they rendered, but because they were not part of the profession, that they were not practicing lawyers. That's why that term came to be addressed. Now, when Lord Spence was also uh, invited to the Madras Bar Association, both the Madras Bar Association and Lord Spence were in a bit of a quandary because Madras Bar Association would never allow a judge to enter its precincts at all. There was no welcome address for judges. There was no farewell address for judges. Once a judge became a judge of the high court, he immediate, immediately broke off all links that he had with the bar. So there were no formal, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, um, welcome a no formal farewell addresses to the judges at all. So Lord Spence, because he was the chief justice of the federal court, was for the first time given an opportunity to address the Madras Bar Association, which did not even know how to arrange the chairs. So here was Lord Spence standing right in the middle. Lord Spence did not know where to go and deliver the lecture because there was no podium, there was no chair, and therefore he just stood in the center of the room and he records it is to his great embarrassment that there were a bunch of advocates behind and there were advocates on all sides. And this was the most peculiar way in which he had ever addressed a meeting. So uh, these are two interesting incidents that happened uh, <clears throat> um, during the visit of Lord Spence. There is one other very interesting incident that happened. When I wrote my book on the Madras High Court, I had interviewed a lot of people. One of the persons whom I talked to was Justice Mohan. Justice Morgan told me, just, Justice Settlebar, uh, Settlebar, the first Attorney General of India, had also been invited. I was also one of the speakers at MBA. And uh, when he came there, he extolled the virtues of the lawyers of the Madras High Court and the judges of the Madras High Court. And you know uh, how it was in the Madras High Court at that point of time. The Madras High Court lawyers, vakils had a tremendous fight to acquire several uh, uh, interesting uh, their attires, right? Right from the gown they wore, the coat they wore, the band they wore, 
all that was uh, was the product of a very very difficult struggle it didn't come to them easily but when they reached eminence and when they showed to the world that they could compete to the best of barristers they many of them were wearing a very strange garb they were wearing a coat they were wearing a laced many times uh, a silver uh, laced turban a silk turban um the gown uh, and then they were wearing a panchakacham and then they were wearing shoes and boots right and to top it all they used to wear earrings diamond earrings and the higher you went in um, the profession the brighter and more expensive used to be your diamond probably blue jagger was uh, what denoted the fact that you had reached the apex in the profession so settlement was asked by justice mohan that uh, you say that all these uh, judges and lawyers were so great and you think so much of the madras high court uh, why don't you then settle down in madras and practicing in the madras start practicing in the madras high court settlement is reputed to have replied i would love doing that but i can't afford the diamonds so this was the type of reputation uh, and this was the type of eminence enjoyed by the advocates uh, of the uh, madras high court one other case and i think i will stop with that um, is a famous lakshmi kantan murder case lakshmi kantan was basically a rascal he was an elo journalist he wrote scurrilous and absolutely defamatory articles about various cinema stars various uh, you know uh, top people uh, in the city uh, and that was his profession uh, two people whom he constantly targeted were ns krishnan the great comedian and tyagaraj bhagavat so these two it is the case was that these two had conspired and arranged for people to finish off uh, lakshmi kant lakshmi kantan was stabbed then on a dark road on a, and then with that knife wound he went to the police station lodged a complaint was later admitted in the hospital and then passed away in the hospital and even today there is a theory that he died more of medical negligence then out of the, the stab wound because the stab wound was not a very critical place it was only in the stomach and he could have been saved the two people who were arrested were ns krishnan and tyagaraj bahu it completely ruined just imagine that you know today there is some famous uh, case and rajnikanth and some top comedian what uh, he made or somebody gets to be arrested just imagine the type of uh, uh, sensation it can create so it created a huge sensation in the 1940s and uh, originally the madras high court convicted them my senior mr govind swami has appeared for uh, ns krishnan and thereafter an appeal was filed uh, to the privy council privy council set aside the judgment of the madras high court the matter was remanded back p l etheraj appeared for the accused and ultimately uh, the case ended in an acquittal for ns krishnan and tyagaraj uh, bahavat but it completely ruined their careers uh, mk t never had a film after that ns krishnan was of a different uh, completely different uh, uh, you know metal and uh, actually oh, uh, k m munshi who was a, who was appearing for one of the accused in the matter p v rajamannar was the prosecutor of the first row and uh, p v rajamannar stood up and said that they are dropping the case against k m munshi and when that announcement was made k m munshi smiled and said that i am no out of the case i have to go back to bombay quickly my senior mr govind swami nayadan engaged him to appear for n s krishnan so munshi told govind swami nayadan we have to go to um, Uh, and get instructions from ns krishnan he is in jail i want to understand what exactly happened during that period and k m munshi records in his memoirs that he has never spent you know one hour laughing like that because ns krishnan spent only 10 minutes explaining the case thereafter he was talking about how the judge was talking how munshi was talking how govind swami nadan was talking and he was imitating all of them and it was such a hilarious experience that munshi says i have never laughed so much in my life 
ns krishnan was like that he looked on all of life as a comedy and it is said that after he was released there was a huge gathering of his admirers and uh, that talk which he gave which was never recorded in celluloid was one of the most brilliant performances of ns krishnan ever he narrated his experiences in jail once again with a with a touch of humor and wit and that is supposed to be his most brilliant performance uh, ever so these uh, are some of the most fast but even he took to drinking gave himself to alcoholism and unfortunately passed away about 6 to 7 years and i remember my my senior mr swaminathan saying that that case is an example to show how judges must not be swayed by what the media writes because you see every every day the trial that happened in courts used to be captured extensively by both the english and the tamil media and all of them would give their opinions and uh, mr swaminathan firmly believed that the media had a role in the conviction of the accused in that case and therefore today we talk about trial by media it is something that appears to have happened even at the time of the famous lakshmi kanthan murder case as i said this is a saga the madras high court is a saga it has been created on account of the sacrifices the hard work the uh, <clears throat> the commitment the sincerity of many people who have come into these buildings much before we did and it is in homage to the extraordinary services and their contribution that every time we step into the high court we must tell ourselves that even if we are not able to contribute to the glory of this institution we shall not do anything to diminish the stature and the eminence of this institution thank you for giving me this opportunity thank you rajesh sir i have one personal uh, doubt i could find the office of sheriff in the madras high court could you yes. please explain how and why it came to the high court building and what is the relevancy of the office of sheriff to madras high court yes see the sheriff of madras is an institution that predated uh, both the supreme court of madras as well as the madras high court obviously if it predates the supreme court of madras it predates the madras high court also the sheriff of madras was primarily uh, the person who was in charge of uh, uh, serving the summons which were sent out from the institution when the system of jury was in existence he was also the person who was in responsible for uh, drawing up a list of the members of the jury he would see much of what happened in the courts was very ceremonial the british wanted to <coughs> overawe their subjects that's why they built all these grand uh, court halls and grand court buildings so the trial also was meant to overawe uh, the witnesses when they get into the stand and make them come out with the truth all this is part of a strategy which uh, human rights activists may frown on today but that was what was done so the there was quarter sessions of the court the court sessions used to sit in four quarters and each used to be called a quarter session so be- before the beginning of the quarter session there used to be a ceremonial procession of great pomp and grandeur when the sheriff from his place which is the place that is today a uh, room which is today occupied by the additional solicitor general uh, he would then go to the uh, uh, chamber of the judge and invite him to take his place uh, in the court and on one side would be the commissioner of police and on the other side would be the sheriff and they would all march in some grand procession to the court and that is how the proceedings would start in admiralty jurisdiction also the sheriff of madras had a role to play he when a ship an order for arrest of the ship was passed he would take the oar uh, go in a boat and would touch the mast of the ship with that oar which signified that the ship was arrested and the notice would then be stuck on the mast of the ship mm. but after uh, the 70s i think dr chokkalingam was the last sheriff of madras 
uh, the office of the sheriff came to be disbanded. All the duties which the sheriff of Madras did are today done by the registrars, the assistant registrars, the judicial registrars, and the various officers. There are, of course, some we don't have session style, um, and uh, therefore the need to appoint jurors doesn't happen. The notice from the court comes flows from the office of the registrar, assistant registrar, and the uh, other judicial officers, and that is how. Um, the, the, the office of the uh, sheriff of Madras has become uh, completely irrelevant today and has been replaced with the registrars. Thank you, sir. And may I know the uh, reason for the practice of uh, having the silver mace? Is it in practice in other high courts also or only in Chennai High Court, Madras High Court? No, it was practiced uh, in the uh, chartered high courts originally. It is oh. an Irish custom. Uh, mm -hmm. Even today in courts in Ireland, you have these mace bearers, uh, staff bearers as they are called today. Uh, the mace bearers actually double up as the judge, judge's driver also in the Irish courts even today because they don't have so many people as we have. Uh, it is basically supposed um, to represent the majesty of law. And that is the purpose oh. for which uh, we had. And also, you had this difficulty that the Unlike the Madurai bench of the Madras High Court, which has a very sensible design that the judge's chamber is just behind his court and mm -hmm. he need not walk down corridors. The Madras High Court was not designed in such a way. Many times and even today, the judge's chambers are in the second floor or in different parts of the first floor and he has to travel to some other part of the court and therefore it necessitated that we had uh, mace bearers who walked in front of the judges and that is that is more a practical necessity that was uh, yes. for why it came to be implemented yes sir. like a pilot before the vap car and yeah. uh, may i ask uh, mr lakshminarayan to um, interrupt with mr uh, nl raja lakshminarayan Raja, just, I mean, I had two questions. Raghavan has already asked the first. Uh, before that, I mean, I loved the lecture, but the one I preferred the best was the last ending line. I mean, let's not delight the institution. I mean, yeah. brilliant. Thanks. Now, I have one doubt. I mean, uh, when we speak about Norton, in, in, in Madras High Court, we speak on him on such high terms. But uh, in Calcutta High Court, they think he has... Uh, he has been a what shall you say a bully or a ruffian who unfairly prosecuted Arbindo. Hello. I mean, when we go to Calcutta High Court and speak about saying that Norton shifted to Calcutta, they say Norton was a bully and a ruffian who unfairly prosecuted uh, Arbindo. I mean, uh, see, these are all matters of opinion. I think you should look at records rather than opinions. Uh, okay. Norton was a stentorian and a sort of a a very, very persuasive advocate. That was his brand of advocacy. And that was his brand of advocacy for a long time. So the fact that he was a bully, the accusation that he was a bully was probably somebody's opinion and they are entitled to that opinion. But please look at his track record. He was the person mm -hmm. who stood behind Vakis in Madras. When the first session of the uh, Indian Congress happened, he gave his entire house for that to happen. Amo Hume okay. visited him at that place. And the first Congress at Madras happened at the residence of uh, early Norton. He was strongly supportive of the self-rule for Indians. And interesting, there is a very interesting okay. happened, incident that happened at Norton's house. Amo Hume was accused by many Indians of just, you know, some superficial involvement in the freedom uh, of self-rule. Nobody called it freedom struggle at that time. Uh, larger strides okay. in self-governance. And uh, they said, okay, if you are an Indian, prove your Indianness. You prove your uh, commitment to Indians by sitting down and having a meal served to you on a plant and leaf. This is the test mm. which was given to A.O. Hume. <laughs> and he actually sat on the floor in Norton's house and ate out of a plant and leaf. And, you know, after the first, uh, the, the Congress asked the British for self-government, the British said, okay, fine. Now, all of you go and give me a basic draft of a document, which we will then um, translate to an act. Nobody from Bombay did okay. anything. Nobody from Calcutta did anything. It was at uh, Norton's behest. And a whole lot of patriotic Indians 
that you had the Indian Council Act of 1892 first passed. That is the first root of self-governance in India by Indians, which then progressed and we had the constitution of this country. So these are facts and I think we must deal with facts rather than opinions. Uh, undoubtedly and also uh, um, Norton left for Calcutta at the fag end of his career. He was not the brilliant person that the Madras High Court had seen. And he left uh, following a very, very unfortunate case against him. You see, he was, he was the first columnist in the Hindu newspaper. He wrote under the name Sentinel. And at that point of time, the editor of Hindu newspaper was a person called Vijay Raghavacharya. It is with the help of Vijay Raghavacharya that an Englishman, I don't know, I'm not a historian. I'm possibly just a chronicler who has some who dabbles in history, but some historian must do a study as to whether an Englishman ever got elected in an election in India. When Madras Corporation okay. had only eight wards, he was elected in triplicate as a member of to represent triplicate in the Madras Corporation. I don't think, okay. I, I would like to be corrected on this, but I don't think any British or Englishman has ever been uh, elected to this uh, uh, by the Indians at all. So therefore, you will see the extent of respect that the Indians had for them. Okay. And the second part, what happened to the mace which they say was placed before the judge dealing with the admiralty jurisdiction? Many of these, see, the charter of the Madras High Court itself has gone missing. We don't have the original <laughs> charter. <laughs> the original <laughs> charter is not there. We won't they have a no, charter, original charter is lost. We don't know where it is gone. The, if, uh, one, in the, the, last, uh, the one in the museum is a Xerox copy. I so guess. somebody took a Xerox. Right? But where is the original? Yeah. The original of the uh, thing is lost. So there are several artifacts like this, which unfortunately the Madras High Court has lost, including the, 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 the boat or which the, uh, uh, the um, sheriff would hold when he went and attached the ship. All these are lost today. We don't know because there never has okay. been an inventory of all the, see, it's only after we took over in the Heritage Committee, we have even made an inventory of all the portraits in the Madras High Court. Nobody has made even an inventory of the portraits of the Madras High Court. So very many valuable artifacts have been lost and we don't know where they are. Okay, thank you. So Raja, Mr. Vishnu Ramu wants to talk something. Vishnu? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, we know that near the uh, AG chamber now, there are two courts. Beyond that, there is one gate which is closed. What was it used for? And secondly, to the left of the gate, there is a staircase and it is uh, closed completely. I don't know why. That's right. So why? that gate was a sheriff's gate. That is the place where the sheriff used to enter the high court and he used to take his place in the uh, office that is now being occupied by the additional solicitor general of India. And I told you about the processions which uh, would be led by the sheriff, he would go up that staircase. That wall is a very, very recent addition. It is only about, hardly about uh, 10 years old. Uh, that wall was not there. And then he would go to the judge's chamber, invite the judge and get him to take his place in the court. So this, all that is part of the path which the uh, sheriff would take. But today, unfortunately, we have blocked that because that became a smoking corner for a lot of advocates. To stop that nuisance, that wall has been uh, erected. Oh, thank you, sir. Ma'am, Hammer Sambat, ma'am. Ah, hello, Raja. I know that uh, the original charter went to the Supreme Court when they conducted an exhibition to celebrate the 100th year or something. And after that, even I had been uh, trying to find out what happened to it. So it may be somewhere in the Supreme Court uh, a junk room. We don't know. We have tried to. In fact, what because I have said I know, is. Definitely it went there. Maybe you can ask the Supreme Court and if their record keeping is better, we can try and get it there. But Please there is one simple. Because, yeah, it used to be hanging in the registrar's chamber. I have seen yes. it when Justice Janardhan I, was the registrar. Uh, you are right. And I have asked Justice Janardhan. He confirms that it was there when he was registrar of the High Court. Yes. And it went to the Supreme Court. 
I don't know what exhibition they had some centenary celebration or something. I don't remember what it was. It went there they and celebrated fifty years. years. They did Maybe. celebrated fifty years of the Supreme Court. Uh, but I don't see why they should carry the charter of the Madras High Court to celebrate 50 maybe. years of the Supreme Court. I know they did. But maybe you're right. But there is a simple All solution. Right. Yeah, there is a, yes. uh, see, the, the British always created documents and duplicates and triplicates. So I'm sure that the original of this is must be in India. There is no India house, of course. Everything in India house has been transferred to the British Library and is either in the British Library or in the British Museum. So if we are able to co coordinate with the British government and sort of convince them to give us one copy, I'm sure the original of that, it is all taken in triplicate. Even the Furman permitting the establishment of Fort St. George in Madras, Patnam, that was created in triplicate. There is one original uh, uh, in India house, one at Fort St. George and the other with the British government. So possibly there is one somewhere, but we have to trace it. The fact is that today it is missing. That's why we follow the printing of triplicate copies, even for yes. an LR petition. Yes, that is the British practice. Yes, for one person dead, you have to fight so many of them. Correct. <laughs> so I think uh, Vishnu has got one more question to trouble you. Yes. Uh, Vishnu? Yes, sir. Sir, um, I was told that below the second court, there was a cell which has been closed. Is it still there? And why was it closed? No, no, the second court, uh, the, it is the third and fourth courts. There is There used to be a cell under the third, fourth, and uh, if I remember right, the numbering, the 11th court, where you would see a wooden plank. Uh, in those days when the Madras High Court had sessions jurisdiction, the prisoners were all brought and kept under the, uh, under the court in a cell. And there used to be a winding staircase. That winding staircase is still there. And you would come into the court and you would be examined by the advocates and then you would go again back. So uh, it is not the second court. You won't find that wooden plank in the second court, but you would find it in the third and fourth court. And you would also see it in the uh, 11th court. Uh, I am not very clear about the numbering. It's the 10th and 11th courts. Raja, sorry to trouble you. Can I ask you one more question? Sure, sure. What is the, the speciality of the canopy in the second court? The canopy, this is what my senior Mr. Govind Swaminathan has said, there doesn't seem to be any written uh, <coughs> uh, uh, evidence of this. But Mr. Swaminathan said there was an, one English judge who was hard of hearing. And in those days, the, there was no air condition facility and mm. the courts used to be thrown open. Mm. And for a long time, that the sound of the trains and the ships in the harbor and the traffic used to cause a loss of a lot of disturbance. Actually, there is a, interestingly, I believe there is an order passed by the court saying that whenever the trains pass that first line beach station, they must not honk. So trains okay. don't do that. And I believe there is an order also to the harbor that their ships must not honk because the court is so close by. But one English judge was very hard of hearing. Therefore, the canopy was placed to reflect the sound so that he could hear better. Something like what deaf people do, like keeping the yeah, hand yeah, like yeah. So the canopy was supposed to uh, do that function. Okay. That's Thank what he and used to say. Okay. Okay. I I read somewhere that the Kalasam of Chennakeshwar Temple is one of the court halls of the Madras High Court. Could you say which court hall uh, um, has housed the Kalasam of the Chennakeshwar Temple? Is it so? Is it no. true? It is. Uh, that can't be true because. It is not the Kalasam. What happened was, see, when um, between 1746 to 1749, the French invaded Madras, right? Uh, Robert Clive then escaped, and then mm. he came back with uh, 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 a set of uh, soldiers. He oh, went yes. to Kadalu, and then uh, sort of came back with reinforcements, and then took possession. And then there was a tra treaty called the Treaty of Isla Chapin, because mm. by that time, the British had uh, captured a place called Nova Scotia in Canada. And the English had occupied, the French had occupied Madras. Mm -hmm. So by the Treaty of Isla Chapelle, uh, Madras came to be exchanged for Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia. And we got back. Otherwise, possibly we will all be talking in French now. Uh, so we got back this uh, territory. Now, when the British got back this territory, 
they did an assessment of what went wrong why did we lose this battle and then they realized why they lost it was this clutter of houses around where the high court uh, uh, currently stands so they decided if somebody were to attack them from sea or from north madras as we call it it is going to be very difficult for the british to respond so they decided to clear this entire space which was a black town in those days incidentally it was not called black town because indians were residing there all the houses in ports and george had to have their exterior walls painted white white so that was called white town mm. and here since it was not painted white this was called black town and then this black town was completely evacuated and sent into george town now two structures posed a problem the chennakesa upperwall temple and oh. the malleswaram temple you can mm. you can demolish houses you can do whatever you want with them but you can't uh, uh, you know touch um, temples i mean it's very sensitive so very mysteriously overnight both temples caught fire and mm. historians say that the british were behind it and the history the british immediately came in and said oh we are very sorry that this happened but we will help you to relocate so they re- relocated these two temples which are still there which are still uh, in part of george town malleswara temple and chennakesavar temple the bit about about kalasam happens this way that for mm-hmm. many many years when a witness got into the box in the madras high court he used to take oath on waters brought from chennakesavar temple temple oh. in the kalasam Oh. Ganges water from the temple brought by a priest along with tulsi leaves, and oh. the witness used to take his oath on that. So oh. that was the uh, um, link that the court uh, maintained with the temple for a long time, till of course under the uh, Commission of Oaths Act, the uh, British removed that form of taking. Oath. But that is the link between not the not the kalasam in that sense the. I but understand. Temple, it is not. It is not the, the hmm. pot that used to carry the, the pot or the pot or something. And one more question, sir. Yes. From which year uh, Pondicherry got uh, the High Court of Chennai uh, to be the High Court for Pondicherry also? After I think 1862 is when the French. Uh, 1962 is when the French uh, quit Pondicherry. Quit Pondicherry. And immediately, yeah. And uh, actually, the uh, French had a very interesting system when I was uh, when I was. co-opted by the supreme court to be part of their committee to edit the book on court of india uh, they requested the uh, supreme court this uh, requested we justice ravindra but who is the current uh, supreme court judge and we, we spent one entire interesting day in fort st george where we dug out a lot of information for the book um, so um, he requested me to go to pondicherry to uh, write about the legal system that was existing there pondicherry had a very interesting legal system they rationed advocates that is at any given point of time there can only be 12 practicing advocates mm. so if i am the 13th advocate i had a hope of getting to practice law only if one of the other 12 resign or die die nice. oh. okay <laughs> so they had a practice of rationing advocates and justice david anusami one of the brightest judges had a doctorate in law but his most fortune none of the advocates either died or resigned or resigned so for a long time he was a law secretary and oh. then just as mahajan when he went to pondicherry found him to be inordinately bright and said why are you being a law secretary i'll post you as a district judge i think i don't know somebody can correct me if i'm wrong he holds a record for holding the post of a district judge for the longest time 17 years he was a district judge of pondicherry oh. i don't know whether anybody has a better record Of being a district judge of the same court for such a long time, and then he got elevated to the High Court of Judicature at Madras. So uh, Pondicherry came in in 1962. As soon as it came in, it got uh, and there were a whole lot of petitions that were filed about what system uh, they had to follow, and whether it was the French system, the English system, and there were very interesting litigations which are all reported cases. And ultimately, mm-hmm. after about 10 years, it all settled down. Settled. thank you sir i think for nearly uh, one hour and 15 minutes i mean you are just enthralling i would say that uh, any topic uh, you choose i think you make it interesting and not merely interesting you do your research almost and uh, none other than can do justice for the topic of the day so on behalf of amicus uh, i thank you very much for the 
for time and energy. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.